So please join me in welcoming Paul. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. And if you can't hear me, let me know. Um, at Bishop Brady, they taught us to project. And so we, we learned uh, very young to try to be heard uh, under penalty of the yardstick. Um, I'm uh, here tonight to talk about a topic that means a great deal to me uh, because of the many, many years I spent associated with the Concord Theater. And um, I love doing these events, particularly with Joe Gleason from the Capitol Center. We've done four or five of them now because I give you sort of the history of the theater and what it was, and then he comes in and talks about what it's going to be. And it's a really exciting way to end the evening because you leave here having found out things you might not have known and finding out you know, that there's a great future for it and that it's not going to be torn down like the railroad station was or some of the other pieces of history in our community that are no longer with us. Um, about a year or so ago, I was at Market Basket and I was waiting in line and somebody all of a sudden uh, tapped me on the shoulder and said, hey, aren't you the kid from the Concord Theater? <laughs> and when you're past 60 and someone calls you a kid, you're <laughs> thrilled right there. But um, I turned around and talked to them and they said, oh my God, I remember you there. I, I remember seeing you there way back in the 70s. And and um, that was nice to know because it was a wonderful job that started out when I was in my early teens as just helping out and then it turned into a great friendship with someone and um, it continued for you know several decades. So I hope I can tell you a little bit about the Concord Theater and also about Concord's love affair with the movies and why the Concord Theater has a special place in that history. Movies first came to Concord in 1897, right down here at White's Opera House on the corner of North Main Street and Park Street. White's Opera House was a large, beautiful, with box seats and balconies, um, theater that had been built in the 1800s by the White family that is also responsible for White's Park or White Park, they call it, but if you grew up in Concord, it was White's Park. Um, so, um, it brought a lot of things to the community, stage plays, opera, a lot of Gilbert and Sullivan, speakers, and other things. Well, in 1897, they decided to give this new idea, this newfangled invention, uh, mo moving pictures, that they were called at the time, a chance, and they showed uh, some movies there, and Concord people went crazy for it. Uh, eventually, the Phoenix Hall also began to show movies, and that was the beginning of movies in Concord. When the City Auditorium opened, they also ran movies there, and finally, in 1912, an actual movie theater was built here, and that was on School Street, where the garage is right now. And it was called Kahn's Theater, C-O-N-N apostrophe S. It was named after Jacob Kahn, the man that built it and lived here in Concord. And it was uh, called Concord's Deluxe Movie Theater when it opened. And they began running movies there too. In 1915, over on Pleasant Street, the Star Theater opened. And that was um, the most expensive movie theater built up to that time in the state of New Hampshire. It cost $60,000 to build. And the Star Theater would continue showing movies until 1951. It's the location of White Mountain Coffee now, that building. And it's where Barry Steelman had his Cinema 93 videos. Uh, for quite a few years. Then the next theater to come along was the Capitol Theater, which opened in January of 1927. And it was the key piece in the theater chain, Maine, New Hampshire Theaters, that was owned by Joseph P. Kennedy, the father of the president. In 1919, he bought this small 
New England theater chain. He wanted to have a reason to go to Hollywood to get away from Rose and to dally with the actresses out there. It's where he met his mistress, Gloria Swanson, and they carried on for about 10 years. But uh, the Capitol was his crowning achievement with dozens of uniformed ushers, Arthur Martell playing the mighty Wurlitzer organ. Uh, performers came in there to perform before the movie, including Burns and Allen, Jack Benny, Eddie Cantor, Al Jolson. They all would come and you would come in and you'd get an organ recital, then you'd get a vaudeville act, and then finally you'd get the movie for 25 cents in the balcony and 50 cents downstairs for an evening's entertainment. So it was quite the social event when the Capitol Theater opened. Uh, the next theater to come along was the Concord Theater. And the Concord Theater came along in 1933. And originally the building that housed the Concord Theater had been the Norris Bakery. And this part of the building pretty much looks the same today as, as it did. The Norris Bakery operated in Concord into the 1920s. They provided uh, bread, rolls, and other pastries for the Union soldiers during the Civil War. And it was a very popular spot in Concord for people who wanted fresh and delicious. They started baking at 1 a.m. in the morning, and people said as drunks were wheeling around around the streets, they would come down there just to smell the wonderful aroma from the baked goods being created. Um, a business contractor and, and a builder in Manchester, Wenceslas Canton, he had been born in Canada and had come down here and gotten married. and. He was approached by Joseph Charbonneau, who owned a number of movie theaters in New Hampshire, who said, would you like to partner on a movie theater in Concord? I want to expand my horizons and I want to open a theater in Concord. And Wenceslas said, okay, I'll do it. So they uh, bought the building 50-50 and then Mr. Canton did the construction work to add the auditorium part to the back of the theater. Um, and when he finished, I don't have a picture from that time, there was no marquee on the theater when it was originally opened. But this is the front part which is still the same as it had been and this is the part that was added on the auditorium in the back. And um, Mr. Canton did not particularly trust Mr. Charbonneau, so to make sure that his investment was looked out for, he asked his, well asked, uh, he told his 19-year-old daughter, Teresa, that she was going to work in the box office and keep track of the money that was coming in to the theater, and so she began there in October of 1933 and 61 years later she was still there. Um, so it was uh, the beginning of the theater. The first film to play there was called The Sweetheart of Sigma Chi. Um, it was a film starring Buster Crabbe, the Olympic swimmer, and Mary Carlisle, the sister of Kitty Carlisle. Mary Carlisle is still alive. She's 107, I believe, right now, but she's still alive. So when the theater reopens, maybe she can come and make an appearance. Um, so, but, um, so this was the original part and then this was added on. The uh, marquee didn't come along until the 1940s, um, which uh, this, it's needed a paint job here, but it was, uh, Teresa bought it for $500 from a theater on Hanover Street in Manchester that was closing and um, had it installed and um, it stayed up until a couple of years after the theater closed in 1994. But 
The theater was known for playing movies. Monogram and Republic were two small film companies. They were called Poverty Row Studios because they turned out movies that didn't have very many stars in them. And they just sort of, um, nobody else wanted to play them. So that was basically that and serials that did very well. And westerns with people like Johnny Mac Brown or names that weren't household names for a lot of people. People. And for 14 years, Teresa became the general manager. Um, she uh, became the bookkeeper for the theater and uh, kept saying to her father, can't we play something other than this type of motion picture? Can't we play occasionally something that's, that's good? And because the Capitol Theater and the Star were owned by Joseph Kennedy, uh, he was not going to allow the Concord Theater to play any of the movies that might play at one of his houses. The Concord Theater had 499 seats. Um, the reason it didn't have 500 is because insurance doubled if you had 500 or more seats. So Teresa said, take a seat out. And they didn't do it fast enough, so she went down and started to unscrew it. Then somebody said, no, let me do that. And that was the 499 seats. Uh, the auditorium had a center aisle and an aisle on each side. It had 25 rows, 10 seats, 10 seats, except for the row that was missing a seat. Um, and it was sloped, so there was very good viewing throughout the theater. Um, and Teresa always said, this is the working man's theater. She was very emphatic about that. Because when people went to the Capitol Theater, they often felt <clears throat> they needed to go home, put on some fresh lipstick, change their clothes out of their work clothes, and you know, get a little bit gussied up to go there. And she always said, I like to the idea that the girls that work at Kresge's, Newberry's, or Woolworth's can just get off of work, walk over to the Concord, catch the show, and not worry about having to be all dressed up. So uh, it was very much not a lot of frills, uh, just basic, but uh, what I think made that different, and it was the same thing that made Cinema 93 different for so long, was there was a face in the theater that you knew, that you saw week after week, year after year, when you went there. You can go to one of the multiplex theaters tonight and then go back next week and a different person is going to sell you the ticket, a different person is going to sell you the popcorn. There's, you could be in any city, you know, you have to stop and say, am I in Concord or someplace else? Because they're all designed in exactly the same way. With the Concord Theater, there was Teresa. You could tell her what you thought of the movie. Uh, you could tell her, you know, anything or ask to have something. And that is a very quick story. Doc Blanchard, uh, Richard Blanchard, a teacher at Concord High, uh, came into the Concord Theater in the early 70s and he said, Teresa, uh, there's a movie out that I really would like to see and I think there might be other people that would like to see it. And she said, what is it? He said, it's called The Trojan Women. It's from the Euripides story and it stars Catherine Hepburn, Vanessa Redgrave, Irene Pappas, and Genevieve Bougeaud. And Teresa said, okay, I'll take your recommendation. Let me call the studio and see uh, the salesman for the studio and see if I can get it. She called the next day. She booked it for a week. Only a 150 people came. She lost money, $600 on it, but she said, I don't care. She said almost every person that walked out stopped and said, Teresa, thank you for playing this. Thank you for bringing this to Concord. Thank you for letting us have the opportunity to see this. And she said that was the important thing. She said it can't be all about making money. And Barry Steelman was always the exact same way about that. You had a face over there. You could go in and say, hey, Barry, there's a movie playing in Boston at the Exeter Street Cinema. Do you think you might be able to get it up here? And he would go and try to get it and play it. So it was the difference that made the theater. So she finally convinced her father in 1947 that Mr. Charbonneau had to go. Uh, every time she would try to tell him, you know, Mr. Charbonneau, let's try to get this picture or try to get this picture, he would say, 
I take care of that. He said, you do what you women are supposed to do. And I'll, he was a bit of a chauvinist. And I will take care of booking the movies I feel are appropriate. So they bought off Mr. Charbonneau. Teresa took over. First movie that she played after she had, oh, this is the opening. This is the opening ad, I'm sorry, for the first picture. Uh, Sweetheart of Sigma Chi. Um, you got a port of call, The Seventh Wonder. You got Mick Mickey Mouse, um, and children were 10 cents, adult matinees were 20, and evenings were 25. And um, over at the Capitol Theater, they were playing Katherine Hepburn in the movie that won her her first Oscar, Morning Glory. Uh, the star had The Solitaire Man, uh, which I haven't heard of, but, um, and The Palace in Pentecook had George Arliss in Voltaire. Uh, if you missed a movie in Concord, it eventually played The Palace Theater in Pentecook, and you could take the streetcar for 10 cents to Pentecook and see the movie, and then take the streetcar back to Concord. Um, but this was the opening ad when the theater opened, and, um, that movie has never been uh, shown on television that I've been able to determine, and it's never been released on video or uh, DVD. But it was from Monogram Pictures, so it's very possible that Monogram, when they went out of business, something happened. Oops, sorry. Uh, anyway, this was the first movie to play after Teresa took over in 1947. Uh, this was the most acclaimed movie of the year. It won the Oscar as Best Picture and a number of other Oscars. It was a movie that everyone wanted to see. At the bottom, you can't see all of it. It says, first three-hour film since Gone with the Wind. Um, which was a big deal at the time to have a movie. Um, it broke records. People were standing along the back. Uh, the police let them sell 20 standees uh, at the time. And this um, may put the Concord Theater on the map as being something other than playing the Bowery Boys or uh, the Three Stooges or something like that. Which Teresa said, I have nothing against all of that, but she said, I'd like to at least one out of every eight or ten pictures play something that would bring, you know, a different crowd. The next one that she played, well, not the next film, but the next good one she played was The Red Shoes, which was a classic ballet film. And again, she packed the house for that and followed that up with Life with Father, that was another big picture. And it was at this time that she got a phone call. Uh, Mr. Kennedy wanted to meet with her. And so Joseph Kennedy and John Ford, who was his day, John Ford had been his uh, roommate in college, and when he bought the theater chain, he installed Mr. Ford as sort of the person doing all of the day to day work and handling everything while Mr. Kennedy had more time to dally. And um, so um, they came up to Concord and they uh, went into the theater, and Mr. Kennedy looked around and he said, Not much to look at. Um, and they sat down and Teresa tried to be gracious and offer him some uh, coffee and he refused and he said I'm gonna make this very short and everything and he stood up while she was sitting down and stood over her and he said Miss Canton you have no business running a movie theater at all. He said, it's fine for you women to sell your tickets in the box office. And he kept poking her as he was doing this to make his point. He said, it's even okay if you sell your popcorn. Uh, and he said, if you're honest enough, he said, I don't know how honest you are, but maybe you're honest enough to do the bookkeeping. But he said, running a first-run movie theater is a man's business and you have no business doing this and I will put you out of business. Um, so that was her introduction to Mr. Kennedy who was not happy at all about, about the uh, situation. She continued to get pictures. Uh, the Star Theater closed a couple of years later which really infuriated him because it meant that she had the ability to get even more more pictures and um, 
it, it was just a situation of uh, she became more determined than ever that she was going to do everything she could to keep the theater running, to make it as nice as possible. She was the first theater to have a concession stand. You didn't have concession stands in a lot of theaters back then. The Capitol didn't because it was looked at in the 30s and 40s as degrading a very elegant, beautiful theater and they didn't want to have to clean up the popcorn on the floor. So she went to the bank and borrowed money in 1948 and had a concession stand put in. Uh, and then um, the marquee came along at the same time that she took over. And she began on the side of the building facing South Main Street, putting up huge posters on the side of the building for particular films that played, that like Around the World in 80 Days or, um, you know, Seven Year Itch. I remember as a young child, we were driving into Concord, driving up South Main Street, and there was Marilyn Monroe, 50 by 40, on the side of the Concord Theater with her dress flying up. And I said to my mother, I said, what movie is that? What's that all about? And she said, you'll know when you're older. Um, <laughs> but that was a way to promote because in those days you didn't have movies advertised on television. Um, the Capitol Theater had a placard that went into every barbershop in town. Uh, movies changed twice a week. A movie played Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday, and then another one played Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. So you had three or four days in which to see um, a movie. Uh, they didn't generally hold over. So um, <clears throat> this was, you know, she considered it to be a good way to advertise, and it certainly did because it brought in a lot of people for you know quite a few films uh, and she continued doing that into the 60s but then it got expensive somebody who was a little tipsy th there were four pieces to it and they ended up messing it up so that the head was in the wrong place <laughs> from the body and she finally decided nobody really wanted to get up there on a ladder on the side of the building and be you know paste all of that up so uh, and the marquee became a good selling point because if you put something on the the marquee, people driving back and forth, at least knew what you were playing. So through the 50s, the drive-in opened, the Concord Drive-In opened in 1951 over here off of Manchester Street. Um, and that's probably part of the reason the Star Theater closed, because drive-ins were a big novelty and the lines waiting to get into there, even with 500 cars being able to fit in the Concord Drive-In, they really would fill up just about every week. Uh, every night. Then another drive-in opened up in Bosquin, the Sky High, and they began, they were known as the Passion Pit. Uh, they played more <laughs> mature films. The Disney films usually played, you know, over here at the, at the Concord Drive-In. And um, this brings me to when I started at the Concord Theater. This was the movie that was playing. Um, and um, Anybody who, who knows me knows that Doris Day and I are good friends and have been forever. Um, at, at this time, we were pen pals. And Doris had written me a, a note. I had said, I'm so excited about seeing your next movie, Caprice. And she wrote back on her stationery and said, please do not go to this movie. This is not a good movie. Avoid it at all costs. Um, she had a husband who was her manager uh, and agent and everything else. His name was Marty Melcher. Uh, James Garner always called him Farty Belcher. Um, he didn't have her best interest at heart. He had power of attorney, signed her to do some movies that were really awful. And when he died, she found he had taken $24 million of her and left her in debt to the IRS. But, so I didn't listen to her any more than I listened to my parents or listened to the nuns at school and I went to see it on opening night. Uh, and stayed for the second show at 8.25. Concord liked to go to bed early, so movies had 6.25 and 8.25. That way, a little after 10, things were relatively quiet, except at Carlin's Cafe. Um, <laughs> so, uh, at, after seeing it the second time, on the way out, Teresa said to me, 
By now, the box office was in the upper lobby. You had this long lobby that was probably about 40 feet long, and then that went into the upper lobby, and that's where the ticket counter was. In 1948, Teresa was in the box office. Uh, she was a big woman in those days. She lost weight later on. And when she stood up to get out to go cash out, she got wedged in the box office between the shelves. So after she was rescued, the very next day her father came and built a counter box office in the upper one that she sat at until 1994. And the lower box office was then used only to store the letters that we would put up on the marquee. But she said to me, did you like this movie? And I said, yes, it was very good. And she said, would you like to see it again? And I said, well, there's no more show tonight. She said, no, tomorrow night. Uh, and I said, well, yes, of course. And she said, well, you'll have to work for it. And I said, what do you mean? She said, uh, the young man that's been working uh, has, uh, is moving to Manchester with his family. And she said, I'm looking for someone else to take his place and to help out as things need to be done. And she said, would you be interested? And I said, okay, how much does it pay? And she said, 75 cents an hour. Well, in the late 60s, 75 cents an hour was a lot of money and certainly was better than the one dollar a week allowance I was getting. So um, I began working there and eventually uh, when I wasn't working there, we continued our friendship and I continued to help, particularly when movies would draw big crowds and she would, you know, need some help. And the movie that drew the biggest crowd in the history of the Concord Theater is Valley of the Dolls. Um, in a city at the time of 28,000 people, over 15,000 tickets were sold to this movie. We had lines that went out the door to the corner of Pleasant, went up Pleasant Street to South State Street, and headed down South State Street in January of 1968 when it was bitter cold and snowing. People stood out there and waited to get in to see this movie. Movies were not rated the R's and the PG's or those at the time. What movies were rated by were generally the Legion of Decency, the Catholic Church, um, would rate movies as morally objectionable um, and uh, X was the dreaded rating that you never wanted to get. Well, Valley of the Dolls was rated X. And if you as a Catholic saw an X-rated movie, it was a mortal sin. Um, uh, Monsignor Buckley from St. John's came to see Teresa about this impending movie. And he asked her to sit down and he said, Miss Canton, I'm going to tell you a story. And she said, yes. And he said, yes. You know the tale of Adam and Eve and how Eve offered Adam the apple and thus began original sin. And Teresa said, yes. And she was thinking, we had just played the movie The Bible, John Huston's movie, and there had been some upset people because in the Garden of Eden scene between Adam and Eve, it's simulated nudity, but you don't see anything because there's always a hedge. Uh, so they're just walking behind the hedge. So there really wasn't anything, but she thought he was referring to that. And he said, no. He said, you are like Eve, Miss Canton. You are offering the people of your community this abomination on the screen. You are affording them the opportunity to commit a mortal sin. And he told her, I do not want you to play this. And she very graciously said, I am committed to playing this. I have booked the film. Um, it's going to show. I'm going to put that it's for mature audiences. I'm not going to allow children or, you know, people that might be susceptible uh, in. But she said, I have, I have booked the film. And he said, well, you are no longer welcome at St. John's Church and walked out. She began the next day going to Sacred Heart Church, where she continued to go for the rest of her life. 
But Valley of the Dolls, just, it was unbelievable, the business. Uh, people just uh, love the film, although I never met anyone who would admit seeing it afterwards. It was like this <laughs> secret, you know, you didn't talk about that. Um, but, uh, and the book had been the same way. It was sort of like Peyton Place had been a decade earlier. You know, everybody went to see the movie or read the book, but nobody would really admit that they did it. Um, um, so this, you know, just really um, was the beginning of an era of playing a lot of films that, that uh, people absolutely wanted to go see. 2001 Space Odyssey, Planet of the Apes, um, you know, just a, a stretch of amazing films. This movie uh, was very typical of what would happen by the time a movie got to Concord. Um, some of you might remember that sometimes it took years for films to get here back then. We were a very patient community. We would very, you know, nicely sit back and wait till it reached us. Um, and this is an example. By the time it came to Concord, it would be now at popular prices, uncut, direct from its road show engagement. And that happened with a lot of films. The Sound of Music um, opened in March of 1965 in Boston and New York and everywhere. It didn't play Concord until July of 1967, more than two years later, it opened at the Capitol Theater and became historically the longest running movie in the history of the Capitol Theater. They had never had a movie play four weeks, ever, in their entire history. And The Sound of Music did, but it was more than two years after it opened. And um, this was very typical. We played Hawaii, we played the Sand Pebbles, uh, a whole string of, of these roadshow movies that Concord patiently waited around for, and nobody balked when we played Thoroughly Modern Millie. No, nobody said anything, and yet when you know the story, it's a story of a boarding house in New York where young single girls come to live. Mrs. Mears, who operates it, always asks them, do you have anyone in the world? Do you have any family? The girls that don't have any family are given chloroform, thrown in the back of a laundry basket, wheeled away to become white slaves. <laughs> and Mrs. Mear and her friends have an opium den. So when you actually analyze the story, there's a lot of questionable things, but nobody said anything. No priest came and told us not to play it, and maybe Julie Andrews just made it all okay, but, um, <laughs> but nobody said a word when we played that, and Teresa commented at the time that uh, I guess all of the shenanigans on the screen don't offend people. So. Um, this was one of the biggest hits that we played uh, when this opened. Um, in fact, um, the three, I, on, on the list, if you picked it up there, I listed in each genre the top five best attended films under musicals and under westerns and under the other things. And the 50 films listed there all were attended by over 10,000 people. So they represent just those, more than half a million tickets sold. This was the third biggest musical uh, that we ever played. The biggest was Woodstock, uh, the documentary about the, the festival that we played in the summer of 1970. And incurred the concerns of Elsie Campbell, who ran the Friendly Club next door to the Concord Theater. She was the house mother, and she was noticing that people were coming out for a smoke break, but it didn't smell like Winston's. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Anyway, uh, the second biggest musical to play was Grease, which had a hugely successful run, and then Saturday Night Fever was, was the third on the list. Um, but uh, it, it, through the years, we did play Up in Smoke, the first Cheek and Chong movie. Um, and uh, Walter Carlson, the police chief, sent an officer in every night to walk through the theater four or five times just to make sure everything was as it should be. But um, Teresa 
continued, uh, you know, booking the movies, making the ads, uh, doing the bookkeeping, selling the tickets, uh, making the popcorn. Uh, she had bought the popcorn popper brand new, and it was the same popper that was there in 94 when the theater closed. Um, and doing all of it, uh, when she had cancer, about with cancer, she scheduled with Concord Hospital to have her chemo at 6 in the morning so that at 6 o'clock she would be at the theater. She never missed a night. It was open 364 days a year. The only day it was closed was Christmas Eve. And uh, it was just, you know, a very important, uh, it was her family. She never got married because the theater took up all of her time. She had a lovely home in Manchester on the corner of Wilson and Hayward Street, but never lived there. She lived upstairs in an apartment over the theater because she wouldn't finish her bookkeeping till two in the morning. And at nine in the morning, she had to be on the phone with a salesman talking about the next picture or something else. Um, and the concession is a very important part of the theater because that's really where you made your profit. Um, what the studios would take was sometimes just unbelievable. The first super deal, which is appropriate since it was for Superman, the movie with Christopher Reeve, the first week Warner Brothers took 90% of every bit of money that came in. Tickets were $2, so Warner Brothers got $1.80 for every ticket and the Concord Theater got 20 cents. So that's one of the reasons that, you know, uh, concession would be important is because you can make, you know, enough profit from that. But it, uh, the business became so cutthroat as the years went by and it was just you know amazing but she just stuck with it she just continued um, this was our second biggest uh, draw in films and it was 20 years after Valley of the Dolls interestingly but Moonstruck stayed around for a long time and people absolutely went crazy over it. They just came back to see it over and over and over again and um, and Teresa loved it every time she'd have to pull out the sold out sign because you know it meant well we're doing something right when we're choosing these pictures. Um, she lost the weight but the uh, diabetes and macular degeneration made it very difficult for her seeing as the years went by but she, she hung in there. I mean, she just really believed her people and, you know, this was the important thing to her. And there's a, a story that's typical of Teresa, which I know a few of you heard that have heard this before, but uh, it happened dozens of times. But I remember the incident when we played the movie Rooster Cogburn with John Wayne and Katherine Hepburn. It was a sequel to True Grit. He was playing the same character. The opening night, there were about 300 people in the theater, which was a good crowd on a Friday night. Um, she got a phone call uh, from a man in Henniker who'd been coming there for 30 years. And he said, Teresa, um, it's, it's um, Bob, and I'm running a little bit late. I'm just leaving now. Do you have a uh, cartoon or short subject or trailer, you know, beforehand so I won't miss the beginning of the movie. And she said, well, how long will it take you to get here? He said, 15 minutes. She said, well, that would mean a 10 minute delay, but she said, I'll do it. Just make sure you get in here, but don't get a speeding ticket. So she went to the back of the theater. There's a, there was a wall back there that you leaned on uh, before the seat started. And she had this amazing voice. She had this beautiful voice beautiful. She would have, could have been a Wagnerian soprano had she wanted because when she would go to church and sing everyone around her stopped because they were listening to this beautiful beautiful voice. Um, when we used to go to the Metropolitan Opera in Boston when they used to tour at the War Memorial Auditorium she knew every opera in Italian, German, French uh, and very softly sometimes you would hear her you know singing along with uh, all of the artists on the stage. She just l loved music. But anyway, so she called out to everyone and said, excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, I know you're waiting for the movie to start in a couple of minutes, but one of my best customers, he's been coming here since he was a little boy, is going to be a few minutes late. So I'm going to hold the movie 
before him. If this is an inconvenience for any of you, please come back. I will refund your money and give you a free pass to come back another time. Well, nobody budged. They were all wanted to wait and see John Wayne. She said, but in the meantime, I'd like to give any of you who'd like it free popcorn. And there was a stampede to the <laughs> lobby. And she gave them all free popcorn. And nobody was angry or upset. But that was very important to her. She had two pockets in the dress that she would wear. It was sort of a jumper. And one was a rosary. rosary because she was very, very religious and sometimes she would just pull out the beads and say them when, you know, the movie was running and there was no need to be doing anything else. And then the other was a little thing filled with change. And when somebody would come to the box office and say, I want a ticket, and if they were short, a quarter, 50 cents, 10 cents, whatever, she would open the little thing and take out the appropriate amount because she said, I don't want them to say, well, I can't afford it, I guess, tonight and leave. She said it's much better to help them out and let them see the movie and not have their evening ruined. So um, I saw her probably hundreds and hundreds of times pull out the little thing. And she'd go to the bank once a week and get it refilled with all kinds of change and pull it out and help people when, whenever they, they, they needed that extra something. But um, she was a remarkable person. Um, I'm working with the people from the Guinness Book of Records to confirm that no woman in history ever ran a first run independent movie theater for the number of years uh, that she did. Uh, they haven't found anyone else, but they have all kinds of things they have to go through to confirm it before they can you know, issue a citation or determine this is the person who ran it more. But she was very shy. Her Catholic upbringing meant you didn't boast about your accomplishments, you didn't put yourself out there, you didn't you know, try to call attention to yourself. Um, and when Barry opened in April of 1967, she didn't feel competition because she said, he's exactly like I was 30 years ago. He loves movies, he cares about the movies, and he's doing it because he wants to bring something to the people of Concord. He wants to entertain people. And she could be very funny. There's a very quick story about um, in the 1950s. Uh, David Niven had a son named James Niven. Jamie was his nickname that people called him. He was attending St. Paul's School here in Concord. Uh, David Niven and his wife came to town for Parents Day uh, to see him. They were staying down on South Main Street at the Franklin Pierce Inn. It's a little inn that, well, it's no longer here. It burned down, but it was next to Waters Funeral Home. and It was a lovely bed and breakfast type place. And they were staying there. And one evening they decided to just walk around Concord. And they walked down Main Street and there was the Concord Theater. And they decided to go in and buy tickets. And see the movie. So they walked in and Teresa was at the box office, at the upper box office, and uh, they said, could we have two tickets? And she looked up and recognized it was David Niven, one of her favorite actors. And she said, oh, Mr. Niven, don't pay. You don't need to pay. You just go right on in. She said, I love your work. I love your movies. And he said to her, oh, do you play very many of them here? And she very quickly said, oh, no, you don't draw flies. But um, <laughs> not meaning to be unkind, but a couple of years later, David Niven won an Oscar's Best Actor for a film called Separate Tables. And there was a Hollywood reporter named James Bacon who interviewed him afterwards and said, Mr. Niven, do you think winning this Oscar is going to change you as a person or as an actor or make you more full of yourself? And he looked at James Bacon and said, that'll never happen thanks to a theater owner in Concord, New Hampshire. <laughs> he did go in and see the movie and he did accept 
free popcorn. And I think he knew she wasn't saying it to be mean. She was just, you know, uh, explaining why they didn't play David Niven movies. Uh, she did always say about three months later, we played Around the World in 80 Days, and he was in it, and we actually sold out. But, um, and she said, I actually thought of writing him a letter and saying, well, you no longer can, you know, in that category. But um, anyway, the theater continued into the 90s doing well. The Crying Game uh, did phenomenal business. Uh, the last summer it was open, the summer of 94, um, a couple of movies did very well. The Piano, which had won the Academy Award as Best Actress, Holly Hunter, and Best Supporting Actress, um, yeah, what, whatever her name was. Um, <laughs> Anna Paquin. Um, and uh, then a movie with Jack Nicholson and Michelle Pfeiffer and James Spader called Wolf, directed by Mike Nichols, did very, very well. But um, in August of 1994, um, a movie played called Andre. You can barely see the ad, but it was the story of um, a little girl and the seal that would return each year to her in Maine, uh, based on a, on a true incident. And it played, and it played for two weeks. As you can see, by then we had so many th other theaters. And the movie that was to play after that was not a available and so Teresa said well I'll close for a week and see if I can come up with something and um she, she couldn't find anything that really made her want to open again. She just, it was like she had reached a point in her life, she was almost 81 uh, and uh, it didn't excite her all of a sudden having to go through this. The salesmen that she dealt with were very disrespectful and would say things like, oh it's the nutty lady from Concord. Um, because they were used by then to dealing with the big chain cinemas and uh, Canad and Hoyts and all of those. And all of the salesmen she had dealt with for years and years were all retired or gone. She'd outlasted most of them. And the young ones, it was, she was just a bother when she would, you know, she was one theater. They'd rather be making a deal with someone who had 300 theaters to fill. And so it stopped being the joyous experience it had been for over 60 years. And I think um, her sister Lori, who was the projectionist for many years, had died two years earlier. Um, Lori was the first female to be a member of the projectionist union when she had uh, become a projectionist uh, back in the 1950s because that was another thing. It was an all-male club and Teresa had a number of male projectionists but she had someone teach Lori how to do it and Lori passed the test to be able to be a licensed projectionist and loved doing it because it was for the family and that was uh, you know very important. But Teresa passed away in 1998. She was uh, 84 and her last wish had been that something happened to the theater. I had uh, talked with a realtor, Jeff Larrabee from Epsom at the time, and um, he talked with Teresa in 1997 about buying it for $150,000. And uh, Jeff was then going to rehab it and lease it to Barry because um, Teresa always said, you know, if anybody could get the doors open again, it would be Barry Steelman. And even though they occasionally butted heads about trying to get pictures, and that was inevitable because they were two independent theaters, two people with outstanding taste in movies and wanting to bring the best. And, um, you know, she said, wouldn't it be nice if that could happen? Well, she passed away and the theater got sold immediately and then it languished for a couple of decades. But the next part of this, I think you will be tremendously excited by what is unfolding. And I know Teresa would be thrilled because uh, she was very forward thinking and, um, you know, really believed uh, that the Concord Theater belonged 
in the Concord community in some form. Uh, so I hope if, if you have any questions before Joe comes on, yes. Yes, uh, would you happen to still have that note that Doris Day wrote about how seeing Yes, I do. And what happened to the marquee? Any idea what happened? Yes, in uh, 1996, a piece of it fell down and almost hit someone. Uh, so the city uh, contacted Teresa and said, you either need to repair it or take it down. And she, I, I talked to her at the time on the phone, and she said, um, I think I'm going to take it down. She said, I'm not going to ever be reopening. And she said, I think it needs to come down. And I, uh, I say in the book that it very much reminded me of that O. Henry story about the last leaf and the woman seriously ill and she's looking out the window as the leaves fall off, leaves fall off the, the plant that's out there. And she says to herself, when that last one falls, I'm going to die. And they go out and they fix it so that it, it doesn't fall off. But I truly believe that when the marquee came down, that Teresa just gave up on, on. When we would talk on the phone, there was no longer any spirit or any enthusiasm or optimism. So it totally changed, uh, changed everything. Where is it now? It was in so many, but the way they took it down, it was in just, uh, yeah, shambles. So unfortunately, I don't think there's anything remaining of it. Uh, but it was beautiful. I mean, when I was first working there, and the neon on it was working, and it was sharp and clear, and you could see from way up by Merrimack County Savings Bank, you could see how that stood out, and it made you very curious, you know, to go there. So, uh, I wouldn't go up on the ladder ever. I refuse. That was where I, I, I set the limit. But. Um, I would tell them what to put on the marquee, and I got into a little, almost into trouble for that. In 1960, very quickly, my last story. In 1969, we played a little movie that we knew wasn't going to make a penny called The Southern Star, and it was based on a Jules Verne story. And it starred uh, George Siegel, Ursula Andress, and um, Orson Welles. And the Southern Star was a diamond that they were going in search of. And so, um, Teresa said, well, what are you going to put on the marquee? And I said, leave it to me. So I went out and got the letters ready for the person who went up there. On the top line, I had them put, see Ursula undress in the Southern Star. <laughs> well, Mr. Boyle, Gil Boyle, who wrote for, uh, I think, Associated Press, uh, every evening he and his wife would be walking up and down Main Street, and I'd talk to them. Uh, he noticed it, and he put it on the wire service, and it went all over on Associated Press and UPI about the Concord Theaters playing. The Obviously, the people changing the sign had other things on their mind, because the sign reads this. We did did so much business on the picture that the salesman from Columbia wanted to know what did you do? No theater in New England, he said, including Lawrence, Lowell, big cities, grossed anywhere what, near what you did. Um, and I think it was probably that marketing. <laughs> There was a scene where she took a bath in a rain barrel, so it wasn't false advertising, but it obviously um, touched something in people. But anyway, but she took it with great humor when people were calling up and saying, Teresa, does she really undress? Um, and things like that, but yes. Paul, do you have any idea when the diner was uh, attached to the side of the building and did the cantons? She cooked in the, uh, the diner when it was originally. I think it was in the late 40s or early 50s when she took over, because I don't think Mr. Charbonneau would have allowed that. Mm -hmm. And then she converted it in 68, turned it, it became the Concord Pet and Aquarium Shop uh, at that time. And then it became, it was the first location for Constantly Pizza was in there in 92 and 93 before they went across the street because she was related by her sister was married to a constant her sister Rena um, so it was a there was a connection there yes okay well now we get to the really exciting future and Joe Gleason will be telling you about that thanks Paul
A, a great presentation as usual from Paul. As he mentioned at the beginning, we've done uh, four or five, I think. I have lost count, which is a good thing. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, my name is Joe Gleason. I'm the Assistant Executive Director at the Capital Center for the Arts. And been there for a few years. I actually, uh, I remember the Concord Theater. This is a picture of the bakery that Paul had shown earlier, too. Um, when I came to town, it was in 1995, the Concord Theater had already been closed, and I started at the Capitol Theater, the Capitol Center for the Arts, uh, as their production and facilities manager. I have not been there that entire time, though. I left after a couple of years to pursue a, a career in IT, mainly due to a growing family. But I'm back, and I'm very happy to be back in Concord, and have been back, I don't know, on the board for five years, and then now on staff for about two and a half. Anyway, we're going to jump in. So we had this lovely uh, bakery biscuit box donated to us uh, just recently, and I thought I'd share the picture of it. Uh, the bakery was there uh, pre-Civil War days, um, and uh, they, uh, whoever it was, uh, I don't remember their name, unfortunately, otherwise I'd let you know, but they, they donated this box. Uh, used to be given out uh, free, non-returnable, it's stamped on the side, <laughs> um, as, as part of, uh, of J.C. Norris uh, Bakery. Um, so anyway, I thought I'd do a little before and uh, current. So this was one of the uh, photos of the old marquee. You can see the Concord logo is a little bit faded there, but uh, I don't know that year I th when it was yellow. 1974. 74. OK, thank you. <laughs> and then uh, the American Bodybuilding Supplement Store was there for several years and uh, moved out last year as the building was being acquired. Um, but that's about what it looked like uh, probably three or four years ago uh, from that photo. Um, I took this photo myself about a year and a half ago when we learned that uh, the current owner at the time, Arthur Asnive, uh, was uh, ready to sell the building. Um, Steve Dupree, a local developer, has uh, approached Arthur every year, I think for the last 15 years, looking to purchase this building. Um, and every year Arthur is not ready to sell unless he sells more property than just this building. And Steve has never been interested in anything other than this building. Um, so about a year and a half ago, we got inside. Uh, Steve Dupree does not want to own the building. Uh, he wants it repurposed, wants it brought back to life. He's, you know, a booster of Concord. Uh, the Main Street Project was a lot of his uh, input in there. Anyway, uh, he invited us and said, would you guys be interested in having this second space? We have a 1300 seat theater and we thought this would be very good for us. Uh, so we took the tour. And it is in uh, a little bit of rough shape, as you can see. And this is looking uh, from the stage towards the back wall. Uh, the projection booth is above that ladder there. You can see the openings through the wall. And um, the 499 seats are still there. <laughs> uh, but it, it has seen better days at this point. The roof structure is, uh, needs to be totally redone uh, in order to make it work again, and quite a bit of other work you're going to see here momentarily. Um, but we love the space. And for a year and a half, we've been trying to figure out a way to move the project and make it a reality. Uh, this is uh, the old concession area in the back. Uh, there was a, a sliding door there, I think, from bakery days. Right. And uh, you see, yes? No, her father put in the sliding door to close right. off the concession at night. At night. Uh, after the second show would start, we closed that. Got and it. People would come out, and they couldn't imagine what had happened to the concession stand. <laughs> it just looked like Because it. it blended right in. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we have plans for the entire building, and we're going to show those here momentarily. Some things that no one else has seen yet, other than the architects 
and the team at CCA and the developer. Um, and here's the first plan. Uh, and I know it's a little bit small, I, I've got a couple of closer views of this, but uh, the theater marquee uh, would have been out here, Main Street's right here. Uh, we'll still have the main entrance with a new vestibule, uh, because people don't like to be cold in the lobby when the doors are open a lot. Um, this space in the, in the front part will be uh, an office area. Um, I, there will be a tenant there, I can't tell you who yet. Um, the concession area is going to stay concessions, uh, yay. Uh, but not just concessions, we're putting in a full kitchen uh, because we want to have a menu and have hot food along with the alcohol sales that were never part of the movie business but are a good portion of the live entertainment business. Uh, I'm going to skip to the next slide. The, the backstage area and all of that we'll see in another a couple of things. So this is a little bigger and you can see it hopefully a little bit clearer. The box office will actually have a window on the street, right where the current staircase is that takes you to the second floor. That's no longer needed apparently. So <laughs> um, we have a brand new stair tower on the side of the building. So right now uh, the tailor shop, the old diner car is right here. That's going to be removed. We don't think it's salvageable, but until we take it out, we're not quite sure. But this will be code compliant. We need elevator access to the second floor to be ADA compliant. Um, the uh, stairwell uh, will service those people that can t handle the stairs uh, or that like to get their exercise. I walk up and down so many stairs each day, it's, it's crazy. Um, the concession stand will have an order window and a pickup window. So uh, there's a little bit of flow there. The uh, original ticket booth, which is currently sitting out in here, will be relocated and saved and uh, brought over to here. So we'll have two entrance ways into this theater lobby. So here's the main entrance lobby. And, uh, and then you're going to go into the theater to the left or right and down the side aisles. Uh, and much like the original configuration, there are two side aisles and a center aisle. And here's the cool part. So we can't make this work as a, lot, as a movie theater. There's two Red Rivers across the street. We don't want to compete with them. We love them. But we do some programming at the big Capitol Theater right now. Uh, which is uh, the Met Opera in HD, National Theater Live, and the Bolshoi Ballet. So our plan is to move all of that down here to get some programming started. And uh, part of the aspect of this is also doing live entertainment. And unfortunately, there are no dressing rooms or backstage area in the existing configuration. So right now, the stage uh, is right here with the proscenium where this black line is, which is now going to be the new back wall of the new stage. So this will be about 15 feet further out into the audience than the current uh, proscenium. Which means that exit door, that's currently an exit door, will actually be a load-in uh, door to get things in onto the stage. So that's all going to be kind of fun. It's very limited back here though, so we'll have a little green room, a gathering room for artists, uh, a men's room and a, a men's room down here and a women's room up here with a shared uh, Jack and Jill uh, restroom with shower. Um, so that's kind of fun. And for those of you that have been reading, it says retractable theater seating. Okay. This is, uh, well, seats are wider nowadays, okay? So we only have eight seats per side, and uh, I think it's 10 rows or 11 rows, can't remember. It's about 172 seats, but we're going to have it retract. It's motorized. So we'll be able to go from a fully seated uh, downstairs to uh, a wide open floor, so we could do different kinds of events there. Cool, huh? Yes. Um, and you'll see some renderings of this that will make that uh, a little bit clearer. One of the neat things though, in order to accommodate that, is we're gonna create a balcony. 
Uh, this theater never had a balcony, now we're going to have a balcony, it'll have about 80 seats. When the seating is, uh, is not retracted, when you come down these side aisles and go up the center, you'll keep going up the center and onto the second floor and into the lounge bar area. Okay? So that's going to be kind of cool. Um, we're, we're loving it. And speaking of the upstairs, here's our second floor lounge. Here you can see the, the theater seats, uh, the new balcony, this double door that will, the projection booth is currently right here, but the double door will go in and all of the partition walls can be removed. There's nothing load bearing and it will be one big open space. We will have a, a bar because you have to have a bar with live entertainment. Uh, we'll have a little bit of storage up here in a, in a closet way. The elevator will come up. There will be this little balcony arrangement. I'm not sure we're going to allow people out there, but I plan on being out there. <laughs> no, I, uh, we'll, we'll let you out there. Um, and one of the interesting things about this space, once we realized that we didn't have posts or anything else in the way, we thought, well, wouldn't it be cool to, in this corner, do a little cabaret stage? So not only were we getting our second venue for the Capitol uh, Center, we're getting a, a third venue <laughs> all in this footprint. So we have two, two places to do performances in here. Uh, inside the building and we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, one of the things with the balcony, because these seats can be retracted, we lose the egress down to the main floor and uh, fire department and life safety codes require when you have more than 50 seats in the balcony to have a second means of egress. So we have this means of egress to get out and now we're going to have a new exit door up there that will take you down that fire escape which is the current alleyway between Endicott Furniture and the north wall of the uh, theater. So that'll be kind of fun. What do you think so far? Yeah. yeah. Might I take a question? Uh, take a question, sure. I, uh, I'm wondering, there's a great uh, tile ensemble that says Concord Theater on the entrance ramp. Is that going to be saved? That is going to stay. Okay. Yes. Now, uh, and I'll speak to the historic nature of things in, in just a few minutes. Um, uh, to make this project happen, uh, the Capital Center is not flush with cash. You might imagine a nonprofit performing arts hall doesn't rake in the dollars that we get to keep, much like uh, movies that uh, you paid the studio almost everything of the ticket price. Think about 85 cents of every ticket that we sell, um, 85 cents on the dollar, right? So a $100 ticket, $85, is going to the artist, okay? So we look at, we have William Shatner next uh, week. Um, yeah, those prices are high because he wants to get paid. And we want to have him there. Um, so here's a nice clean look at the second floor. Uh, this is a soffit that will hold the duct work for the air conditioning. We will be heated and air conditioned. There will be a brand new sprinkler system, all of that stuff. And here's the concept, a little bit refined. Some of you may have seen this image with a different style marquee with the word wow on it. Uh, it's been floating around for a year or so. This is the current uh, model that we're looking at. Um, where it says Capital Center for the Arts, well one way to make this project happen was to secure a naming opportunity. So there is a very uh, a prominent uh, business that will be naming the building. So unfortunately it, we will not be calling it the Concord Theater uh, in its next incarnation. We will be retaining that threshold and so people will still have that and we hope to actually retain the vertical where it will say Concord. Yeah. That is still being negotiated. There's lots of things like that happening. I'm pushing hard for it because I think it's perfect. Uh, we're putting real neon on the marquee <laughs> because the old one had real neon. Um, 
one of the cool things though, obviously with new technology, these billboards will be no more climbing the ladder. Paul, I'll let you reprogram the thing and <laughs> you won't even have to leave the ground. Um, it, it will be a, a digital LED uh, panels, uh, much like our big marquee down the street. Um, so that's a little bit of a concept of what this looks like uh, from the front, from the street. All of the windows will be replaced uh, with hopefully better energy efficient ones, but we're gonna maintain that look, okay? We're not modernizing anything. The only thing that's modern on this, other than the marquee with a little Art Deco treatment to it, uh, is this new stair tower. And uh, for those that are following the arcane procedures of what you need to do to get a building up and running, we had to go before the Architectural Design Review Committee uh, just a couple of days ago. Uh, they saw the plans, they saw the two additions that we're planning. The addition is the stair tower and, believe it or not, the kitchen concession area. We're going to extend that out to uh, the property line. No one will see that addition except from the inside. So from the ex exterior position, uh, the ADR didn't really have any uh, reason to complain about that. This they liked. They didn't want it too close to the brick. They, it had to be a contrast. So, all right, now here's the fun things. We, we've got some sketches. I wanted to have the full walkthrough done tonight so that we could sort of fly through the building. I don't have that. The backstage area where the dressing rooms will be, uh, uh, an entrance on each side. We're looking at the stage here. All of these uh, beams are a combination of steel uh, and uh, wood, uh, LVLs, laminated uh, uh, beams. Uh, and you can see the seating area with the balcony and someone standing way, way back there. All this other stuff, th these things, this is lighting equipment, lighting truss. You guys, guys have all been to a rock and roll concert or anything? Or, you know, so. It's gonna be a, a modern look inside as far as the theater space itself. We're gonna maintain the historic aspects in the lobby with the original uh, wall sconces, which we're gonna to convert to LED lighting. Um, here's a nice side view that gives you a real understanding, I think, of uh, you know, the, the, the spacing that we're gonna have in the seats. You'll be coming down the side aisle. Um, Projection screen uh, is kind of shown mounted on the back wall at the moment. There's, I'll talk about that in a few minutes when I see another slide. Uh, but that's kind of what that's gonna look like. Uh, and uh, the new balcony I think is, is pretty exciting because one of the things we hope to do here, and this is a view from in the balcony, one of the things we hope to do here is bring in a younger uh, demographic, you know, uh, the Capital Center is uh, bigger and tends to be uh, an older uh, demographic there. We do have some younger uh, programming in that space, but it's not consistent enough to keep them coming back. So we hope to feed into that with lots of events for the 20 to 30 something crowd, uh, the ones that don't have kids yet, you know. Uh, <laughs> darn it. <laughs> um, and then here's a view from the stage looking out towards the theater. Um, so in the balcony, this is an exit door that takes you over the uh, uh, concession roof and down the fire escape to Main Street as a means of egress. This would be the double door, so you would be able to walk up here and go straight into that second floor lounge. And then on either side uh, will be observation portals, okay? Uh, they're not going to be small little windows like the original projection booth, but it's a little bit of an homage to that. Uh, but we're planning one on each side and, uh, you know, if it's a quiet show and you've got a noisy, you know, uh, youngster with you, let's say, um, you can hang out back there and still see the show. Or if you stepped out and went to the bar and you want to wait until that next break, you can still see the show. Um, and then this is the little surprise thing. Um, we're, this is not part of the project, but we hope to get it done in this first phase. 
and that is uh, the alleyway between Outfitters uh, and uh, the theater uh, will be a new plaza. The loading dock up here will double as an outdoor stage. So guess what, we get another venue. <laughs> um, and where it looks like it's actually a picture of the building again, uh, that's a giant LED video wall for currently being contemplated as a place for public art that can be changeable. It's digital, so you can, again, no climbing involved. And speaking of a large video wall, that's actually what we hope to put inside as well. Instead of doing a projector and a screen, we will have a LED video wall uh, mounted in the theater and use that for everything from uh, the movies that we'll show through our HD programming and uh, backdrops for musicians Then you see a lot of shows where they like to show video along with whatever they're doing and it's a great way to get that done. It does not come cheap so and I wanted to show you we're on the cutting edge with this stuff. The first theater in the country with an LED video wall is in LA just last month. Um, okay? Yes. So we hope to have that in our space. This is actually uh, a trade show from the supplier that we're looking at. Uh, this is not their best screen. This says P4.8. That's the millimeters of the LED. We're going to a P2.4 or something like that. It, it'll be indistinguishable from a, a movie screen, um, you know, unless you're like three feet away. Uh, so th that's sort of our cool stuff. Um, and we'll be doing separate fundraisers for that <laughs> along the way. How much does all of this cost, you might ask? I'm going to answer that question myself in case no one asked it. It's roughly five and a half million dollars. Construction does not come uh, inexpensively in this state. Uh, the economy's on an upswing. Uh, you might have heard about the potential, you know, for steel and uh, tariffs and whatnot. Aluminum. Well, that lighting truss is all aluminum. The roof structure will be steel. Yada yada. I didn't mention it, but it's also worth noting. The sidewalk level at, at, at the street level is the plane throughout up until the stage. So there is no more sloped floor. It will be one uh, surface with appropriate expansion joints and all of that. Um, but we're not having a ramp incline up or down. It's just you walk in off the street or from the side entrance or from any of the exit doors and it's just straight. So we kind of like that approach as well. And with that, I could take questions. <laughs> yes. Oh, yes. Then you. Directions, but which side of this is that outdoor screen going to be? Okay. So Concord Co-op is down this side of the street, and if I'm looking at this and walking this way, I would turn left into that alley. So Red River Theaters is on the other side of the street. Does that help? Still be able to get into outfitters and deliver things? Yes. Yes. Um, interestingly enough, there's. Um, so, Outfitters is sort of here. They're, they're showing it without Outfitters here so we can see the side of the building, but it's that Victorian that uh, was actually owned by Norris, the owner of the bakery, and that was his house. Um, they uh, load and unload furniture and whatnot in the alley currently. Um, and at the back of the property, on the left side of the alley, theater on the right, there's a, there's a garage, a brick structure. Um, we're not purchasing that. Steve Dupree is. He has some plans for that. I can't tell you what they are because I don't think he knows yet. Um, but it will be complimentary to what we're doing. The alleyway itself is currently owned right down the middle by the Concord Theater and the garage property. 
outfitters and there's no easement for any other use. So the Capital Center likes to play nice with everybody. So you know, we're going to figure out a way to make it work for outfitters to do what they need to do and for us to do what we need to do uh, to, to run the business. Um, you had a question. Can you divulge the name of the uh, uh, company that's going to rename the building? You can't do that, but you know it. You, you know it, but you can't. Okay, so we could get it out of you for your leave. No. <laughs> the other thing I was wondering about. No, I, I, unfortunately, I can't. I understand. Yeah. Uh, the, other, the other thing is, is there any plan to repurpose the uh, old seats? In the so, the good question. Actually, the new seats are uh, going to be uh, purchased from Hussey Seat, which is over in Maine. Uh, we actually demoed a couple of different seating systems. Uh, uh, we like the comfort factor of the model that Hussey has and their retractable system. Uh, it's all made in the U.S. It's only an hour or so from us for spare parts, etc. Um, there were a number of other factors that went into the decision and they also happen to have the best price. So a win all the way around. But with that system, we do not need the original seats. Um, there are well, there's a couple of ways to go and we haven't decided yet. When the Capital Center redid the balcony several years back, um, they made the original back balcony seats available to anyone that wanted to come and have a piece of the Capital Center. And I got eight of them. From <laughs> <laughs> I still have them uh, because I was crazy and I was going to build a little home movie theater in my house, which I never did. But I still have the seats. And a lot of other people did the same thing for whatever purpose and uh, they cleaned out the place. We may do that here, we don't know. There's also some seating companies that refurbish old seats and they're always looking for these cast iron uh, standards. Uh, they're, they've got some value to them and we need every dollar we can get to get the project going so, or finished. <laughs> it's gonna get going. Um, but uh, it's going to be a cost benefit of can we get dollars for it that we desperately need for the project or do we just, and we don't want to demo them and throw them in the trash necessarily, um, but whatever the least expensive way to get them out of the building is probably what's going to win. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing a seat company will probably do the best. Uh, back there and then you. <laughs> I'm wondering about the size of the stage and how many people can fit in the lab. Uh, and on your way out, I do have a handout back there that talks about our capital campaign and gives a couple of the specs from uh, the theater. Um, 280 seats. The stage itself is 15 feet deep. And we're currently doing it without a proscenium opening. So it will be, just like in here, wall to wall, which is about 44 feet. We will mask that off with draperies, um, but when we need to do it wall to wall, we will open it right up. So it'll be totally flexible, and that's one of the things we really needed out of the space. Uh, yes, <laughs> sorry. Given, given the fundraising, obviously, we have a big piece of it, I imagine, but what type of timelines are you thinking, or hoping, or dreaming? Or? Well, I can tell you, uh, we've had several I'll call them near-death experiences in getting this project going. Um, and I'll do the short version, which is in order to make it work, five and a half million is a lot of money. Uh, there is a program called New Market Tax Credits. This building currently sits in a zone within Concord that it qualifies for, qualified for up through the end of 2017. We got our application in and we purchased the building through Steve Dupree in order to make sure we stayed in a qualifying status. That zone no longer qualifies. The money has been allocated. It's handled by Mascoma Savings Bank. They run the New Market Tax Credit Program in the area. Other buildings like the Smile Building across the street from the Capital Center use this funding mechanism. It's worth roughly 1.4 million dollars to the project, so that's money we don't have to raise, which is very good. Um, but they have us on a very tight timeline. 
because the eligibility is passed and they need to get the funding from this program out the door so they can get their next round of funding, we have to move this along. That has given us a lot of heartburn over the last six months uh, and we've jumped through a lot of hoops to get to where we are today and that means we are closing on the building. Uh, remember Steve Dupree purchased it at the end of December to maintain our qualification but we've looked at the structure of new markets we ditched historic tax credits because the value just wasn't there for you know the paperwork requirement that you'd have. Uh, so we're working towards, we have a meeting every Thursday now on the phone. Um, two weeks from now we begin the closing process with all the banks and lawyers. It's very expensive and annoying. Um, but that puts us on track to sign the deal June 27th. A, the Capital Center for the Arts will own the building at that time. Actually, a new nonprofit entity that is a support affiliate of the Capital Center for the Arts will own it. It'll be called CCA North. Uh, and that's to satisfy new market tax structure. You don't want to know the number of boxes in this diagram. But um, June 27th, we close. July, we start construction. April next year, we open. April of 19. That's, that's the timeline we're on. And in the, in the midst of doing all of this, the management team at the Capital Center, which is, uh, there's about three of us, myself, Nikki Clark, the executive director, and Christine Bogaz in particular, our finance director, along with Steve Martin, actually four of us. Uh, Steve is our production and facilities manager. We have been working around the clock for several months, in addition to running the building that we've got and raising money to find the way to do this. Uh, so it's, it's been some sleepless nights and things like that, but uh, it's moving, it's gonna happen. Now, we do not have all the money in hand. So yes, we are still fundraising. Um, what we've managed to do is secure a financing package that includes a naming opportunity, um, a bridge loan, uh, based on our pledges that we've received to date because that cash doesn't come in immediately it comes in over five years typically um, so we will have what the capital center needs to bring to the table is four million dollars on june 27th it puts it into a big leveraged lender entity that the construction draws out of and of course the other 1.4 will come from the tax credits, so that's 5.4 or 5.5, somewhere right around there. <laughs> it's, it's a lot more complex than that, but uh, we, we feel confident that uh, the pledges we've received to date put us on the right track, and uh, uh, we're always looking for more, of course, but I'm excited. Less than a year now, we'll be open. Wow, that's amazing. Yes. This is a detail, I'm way down the oh. Yeah. But will you have something in tribute to um, Teresa Canton in the theater somewhere? Yes, actually, uh, although we don't, we're not doing historic tax credits, we're trying to retain pieces of the theater. Uh, there were these uh, marquees on uh, display cases in the lobby. We're keeping those and repurposing those. Um, I think it's going to be upstairs near where the projection booth was along that uh, outer wall will have a, a history wall uh, and it will uh, you know have hopefully some information from mm -hmm. from Paul <laughs> uh, so that we get it correct um, but uh, it hasn't been designed yet but it'll get there and and we're gonna give a nod to the as knives who God bless them you know owning a building like this that has no cash value really unless you sink millions of dollars into it to run a theater as a nonprofit still has no cash value um, <laughs> uh, is uh, thankfully he did not turn it into a parking lot or anything else it sat here uh, the front sections actually in pretty good shape with the new roof the back section we've got a lot of things to do um, so and all new plumbing and heating and air conditioning and all that I don't know how close we are to our time Oh, we got, looks like five, ten minutes. Any other questions?
questions. So the, the theater part currently has curved lines at the ceiling. Mm -hmm. Is that going to be gone in the new construction? Yes. So, uh, yes. So you remember that first photo, there's a coved uh, arched ceiling. It's in very bad shape. Um, there's no salvaging it, so it would have to come down. This was one of the things with historic tax credits. Um, the money to, you know, sort of restore that after the structural work was done. Uh, it was just the, th the things that you had to do, were, it was more than that. Uh, we wouldn't have been able to move the stage, which meant we would have had to put an addition into the alley. And all of a sudden, the cost to, to do the historic restoration, we just wouldn't have been able to do the project. So we're going to do the best we can. Uh, the cove uh, will go away, yes. And it'll be exposed rafters, a painted black and sound baffles and things like that. Uh, you had a question, yeah, sorry, uh, and then you. <laughs> the 499 seats that were originally there, you're putting 280 now? Is it 100 and It's about 280 to between the balcony and the portable ones. And, you know, the capacity is less because the seats are wider for more comfort. Mm -hmm. So we can't get 10 per section uh, with the three aisles. But you had also mentioned they retract. How is that? that that's an interesting. You said something about showing how that worked. But, uh. All right, so uh, it's really kind of cool. Uh, the drive motor sits at the front of each section and all of these risers store underneath each other because the seats fold down. So when the seat folds down it slips under the one and it just comes all the way back, sits right here in the storage unit uh, and it's like five feet deep for this seating section. It's, it's pretty cool technology. Um, because we like there's more people yeah. wanting to stand and, and... Yeah, so some of the shows that we're going to do there, the younger rock concert-y type things, more club-like, will be a standing room crowd. Mm -hmm. But what I like is having the balcony as well, because I like that kind of stuff too, but I don't want to be standing up for three hours. Yeah. Uh, so, so I'm going to be in the balcony a lot. <laughs> yes. Is this PowerPoint on a website? It is not, uh, not yet. Uh, we, there, there's some announcements that have to happen with the person, the, the entity doing the naming opportunity. Um, I can tell you uh, what we're trying to do uh, for market days. Uh, we are programming three nights of music at the South Stage which is conveniently ne right next to Vibes, which is right next to this. And uh, we hope to be able to do, just before the construction and demo starts, we'll be doing some tours, uh, primarily for CCA members. So if you're not a member, <laughs> we'll probably have to have you become a member to get the actual tour. Uh, but in the meantime, I expect probably in the next two weeks, I am going to put a, uh, a, a monitor uh, out in the window of the, uh, the old American supplement store, since we still have power, and I'll be running a, a video loop out there. So as you walk by, hopefully you'll be able to see that. Yes? And why did it take so long for something to happen? Uh, I know when Red River uh, was sort of being you know, formulated, uh, they looked at this space. Uh, I think back then it was three million dollar project um, and it wouldn't have given them uh, the ability, uh, the way it is, it's very long and narrow mm -hmm. and they needed multiple screens. It just didn't work for them and the cost was higher than they eventually ended up with. Um, I don't know. Uh, it, it, there's not a lot of people out there with five million dollars or three million dollars to spare that can just say, "Let's renovate that thing." Mm -hmm. And for a developer to do it, you gotta, you have to have some kind of return. The bank won't lend you the money unless the developer's super rich and can just drop three, four, or five million in here. Uh, you'll never get that money back out. And in fact, we will not get our money back out. This is a five and a half million dollar project. The building will get built. We expect positive operating results 
from it, but and I did the modeling for that, we're probably looking at about $100,000 to $150,000 a year as profit, surplus if you will, but we plow that right back in because there's always improvements to be made and uh, you know, it's... Well, so who is owned it all this time? Uh, Arthur Asnive, uh, who is a... He, uh, no, I think someone else, uh, was it her nephew that yeah, sold her it? Her nephew, Paul. Had, Paul Constant. Yeah. Right. And then it got sold off to the Asnives. Uh, and they, I think that was, I don't remember what year that was. It's uh, 99. 99? Yeah. Yes. And uh, Arthur, uh, you know, they, they rented to the uh, tailor shop and the yeah. supplement store. I could tell you the property taxes on that were roughly 12000 a year in its current condition and the rents from the supplement store and from the tailor shop probably covered that and not much else. Mm -hmm. So it, it was enough for Arthur to say, it's not costing me money, I don't have any money to fix it, it's, I don't want to tear it down. If he wanted to tear it down and make money on that property, he could have. Yeah. So, so we thank him for maintaining yeah. at least the ability to see it back into, into use. I mean, he never had an original vision when he bought it, or he just... I, I, well, I don't know. Actually, I've talked to Arthur quite a few times, but uh, I don't think I ever asked him, hey, why'd you buy the building in the first place? Right. <laughs> I, I, that, that actually never came up in my conversation with him. I know he really wanted it uh, to work with Red River. Um, and he worked with Barry Steelman and the Red River uh, folks at the time to try to figure out a way to make it work, but just a lack of resources. Mm -hmm. and, and like I said, it, it's a stretch for us, but part of our plan, never mind this building, we're looking where we are. We've been there for 22 years. We opened in 1995 after a renovation that was $4 million worth of the Capitol Theater. Um, We've done a second renovation since then in 2003. That was another $4 million or so. And that finally got it into shape. Uh, but our current business model, the, the number of days of use that we can get out of the building with shows that will actually give you an operating income to keep the lights on and keep replacing equipment as it ages out. We've already replaced all, our entire HVAC system in the Capitol Center. It cost a lot of money, a part of our capital campaign. Uh, so the feasibility studies we did for the campaign said, your business model, you can keep going along, but every five to ten years, you're going to need to raise another million or two dollars just to keep up with repairs. So we changed the model and said, we need another venue that will throw some additional dollars in and give us a little breathing room mm -hmm. and the original plan there was to build it within our footprint and that had some severe limitations. Uh, we had only dedicated about two million dollars of a capital campaign for that and you just heard me say it's actually costing us four. So we've already committed to raising an additional two <laughs> million uh, and we've really spent quite a bit of time on this project in the last year. So, um, But it's worth it. And it's really worth it for Concord to have a venue like this. The size that we are is different than anything else in town. So we've talked to all of our friends and neighbors, if you will. The city auditorium is 800 plus. We're 1,300. Hatbox is 100. Uh, Red River is 158 is their big theater. and. So there's nothing that's like 300 seats, and there's a lot of programming that can fit in a 300 seat theater, or 400 plus withstanding, that isn't coming to Concord. And so we thought it was a great opportunity to bring that type of programming here and give us another option, so. How yes. much are those indoor outdoor screens? <laughs> 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 Yay, what a good question. Uh, so a projector and screen would set us back about sixty to seventy thousand, uh, bare minimum. Uh, the LED video wall, which would be about twenty-five feet wide and fourteen high, uh, approximately, is one hundred and ten thousand, which is 
not bad. I mean, it's not bad. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it, it, we did not think of that when we were budgeting the original project, so we had money in for a projection system. If we want to spend an additional fifty, sixty thousand for the video wall, that is additional money we, we're going to have to find, and we want to do it. So. Yeah. Yeah. I'll keep talking to you as we go out, though. <laughs>